Welcome to Uncaged on Talk Sports MMA YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe. I'm Adam Catterall. It is a pleasure as always to be in your company. And this man is counting down the days. August 23rd is the date for your diary where you'll see this guy in the smart cage once again. Semi-finals of the PFL are well and truly upon us. The one and only Mr. Brendan Lochnane. Did you get itchy knuckles at the weekend, mate, with fellow uh, town lady, if we can refer to her as that, Dakota Dechiva doing her thing in the semi-final? We'll talk about it a little bit later on in the show, but I'm sure with the semi-finals kicking off, you were sat there on your couch going, fancy a knock, get me in there, I'm ready to go. How about two manks holding this promotion together? How about that, Adam? Yeah, that's what we are. Me and Dakota are holding the gaff together. Listen, she looked tremendous at the weekend. You looked tremendous so far. We'll talk a little bit more about her and her performance in the semi-final and what she's doing and how far this could actually go and how big it yeah. could be for MMA in the UK with a, a win for Dakota a little bit later on in the show. But we're going to touch base, first and foremost, with UFC Abu Dhabi. When they announced this card, uh, Nick Diaz was originally on it, taking on uh, Vicente Luque. We said, if you're going to put Nick Diaz on the same card as Tony Ferguson and not match him together, there's something drastically wrong. Obviously, Nick Diaz's fight fell off. We got a new co-main event, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Tony Ferguson's fight with Michael Chiesa went ahead and it didn't last too long. Here's the headline, mate, right? The headline is that Tony Ferguson, a man that many on the planet in 2018 thought might be the best lightweight in the world, has now racked up the longest consecutive losing streak in UFC history. Eight on the spin. Can you believe the dramatic fall from grace? I feel like we're at that time now, Adam, with uh, Tony, where, you know, his family and friends, the close people around him, his coaches, all these people that are so-called got his back need to put their arm around him and say, Tony, it's time, mate. Father time catches up with us all. And it's just that time for Tony Ferguson to give us so many great memories over the years. But it is that time, unfortunately. Have you ever had a conversation with Tony Ferguson, mate? There is no telling him to do anything. He's his own man, isn't he? If he don't want to go, he ain't going. He's going to have to be dragged out of that octagon, kicking and screaming. But at what point do commissions step in? At what point do wives step in and families and friends and kids? And At what point does all that happen? Because how many is it now, the stat man? Eight on the spin. UFC I'm record, mate. Taking BJ Penn's record at the weekend. Come on, come on now. Like, the guy's a legend of the sport and he's still talking about, well, I'll just go elsewhere then and I'll just fight elsewhere and I'll I'll do this and that. Listen, it's a massive identity crisis for us all when we come to the end of this because this is all we've ever known. And this seems where Tony Ferguson's at mentally. But it is just that time, you know, we've all got to deal with it and, like, someone needs to sit him down and deal with it. It's not even like we're now in competitive fights, split decisions, could go his way. Mm. We're getting finished quick. Quick, of like, yeah. yeah, of people that haven't fought in a long time. So it's like, you know, they're trying to tee him up, but they can't anymore. It's definitely time to have the conversation. Yeah, I think he wants the decision to be made by somebody else. He doesn't yeah. want to make the decision himself. We saw in the way that he kind of semi-retired at the weekend. Right, I'll put one glove down and I'll keep one glove for myself and I'll, I'll walk Come on. away. And... Listen, he has a massive love for the UFC. He served the UFC incredibly well. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a backstory as to how this decline kind of started because he was a proper company man at the start of the pandemic on the back of a 12-fight yeah. winning streak. But he kind of, just the way that he was speaking to DC in the octagon off the back of the defeat to Michael Chiesa in the first round of the weekend, it was kind of like, can somebody else make this decision for me? And I think they will. I think they'll do it compassionately. I think Dana White and the UFC brass there will make that decision. And I genuinely don't think he will go and fight anywhere else. I think that he has just got to love the UFC. He wants to stay at the UFC. But I think he knows in the back of his head, he isn't at that level anymore. If you look at the guys that are beating him, don't get me wrong. They're all top guys, fit top 15 rankers. But we're talking about Tony Ferguson here, a guy that wants to be champion, a guy that wants to compete at the very, very, very highest level. And that's just not going to be anymore, sadly. For those that don't know too much about him, and that, the, listen, there's a lot of new fans that watch our show, mate, that have probably never seen Tony Ferguson win a fight and they're wondering what all this blooming fuss is about. Yeah. Tony Ferguson went 12 on the spin in the lightweight division, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Beating former champions, finishing former champions, submitting them, razor blade elbows, you name it, he had the lot. He was sensational to watch. Very unorthodox type of fighter. And then the pandemic hits. Now, 
In 2018, I was one of those people that said, Tony Ferguson might just be the best lightweight on the planet. He might be Khabib's kryptonite. He might be the guy to take Khabib's zero. And a lot of people were on that bandwagon. And I feel for Tony Ferguson at this stage, mate, because he's never had the opportunity to really prove that statement to be true. He's never been the full champion. It's always been interim. He had five fights booked with Habib. Five. From 2015 through to 2020, he had five different dates. All falling off for different reasons. Sometimes he was injured. Sometimes Habib was injured. The final one, if you remember, was about the pandemic. We thought we were getting it. April 2020, Habib, Tony Ferguson booked for the five time and everything was going in the right direction. Then the world shut down. Big pandemic kicks off. The UFC is scrambling around looking to try and keep the show on the road because there was no live sport anywhere in the world. Habib couldn't get into America because of the travel restrictions. So therefore, Justin Gaethje put his hand up. Tony Ferguson never flinched. Bear in mind, 12 fight win streak, interim champion. His next fight's for the full title. The full title's now no longer on the line because Habib's out in Dagestan. But he still says, yeah. He can't train anywhere. He's training in his garage. On, we all saw the videos of, it, of the way that he was training. And then, as fight week approached, American commissions said, hang on, this is ridiculous. You're not doing this. We are not putting this fight on. And they pulled the fight in April. But Tony Ferguson made the biggest error, maybe, of his career in that week. And made weight. Still, he still yeah. made weight. Yeah, he, he, he made weight for that fight. And then the fight got rebooked three weeks later against Justin Gaethje again, another change of opponent, out in Florida. And he made weight again. So a double weight cut within three weeks. And then he went into a fight with Justin Gaethje and probably took the biggest beating Vicious. of his life. And he's never, ever been the same since. Being a company man, putting his hand up, never saying no, taking anything that comes his way to please the fans, cost him the opportunity to prove just how good he was. It's a shame. Because when we're talking about Hall of Famers, we talk about facts and stats, don't we? We use numbers to back up our arguments as to, well, this guy beat all this. He was the champion. He defended this many times. Ferguson sadly hasn't got any of that. The stat that is going to haunt him forever, sadly, is that he's got the most amount of UFC losses. But that doesn't tell the story of, of, uh, of Tony Ferguson. Consecutive losses, that was. It doesn't tell his story at all. Well, let me just touch on one of the points in there. Well, a couple of the points. Number one, completely agree with you about the making weight thing. That was just a typical Tony Ferguson move. I'm going to do it anyway, cutting all that weight. And to me, he's a big gentleman and he, look at and he cuts a lot of weight. So to do that, and then three weeks later, hydrate and do it again. Um, you know, who was... Again, we go back to people that are advising him, but let's leave that one there. Justin Gaethje took that man's soul. Now, guys, if you're watching this, guys and ladies, listen, do yourself a favour. Get on Fight Pass or wherever you can find that fight. It was during COVID. I specifically remember it. The beating that Justin Gaethje give Tony Ferguson is one of my most memorable of all time. It was no crowd, mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. When I say vicious, it was, mm -hmm. it was ferocious. It was a good old-fashioned hiding. And the, 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 the ferocity on the shots from Gaethje, that was Pete Gaethje. And it was, you know, it was Pete Gaethje and you had a Ferguson who was just over the edge and it was vicious. And I know, I mean, watching that fight, you don't really come back from them type of beatings. And he didn't, Adam. He never did. He never did. And it's such a shame that we find ourselves now eight consecutive losses because he doesn't deserve it. The Tony Ferguson that gave us all those moments in the build-up to that point doesn't deserve to go out like this. And it's heartbreaking when you see him fight the way he's fighting because he looks slow. He does look old. And then when you see him on the microphone, you can see it's heartbreaking. And if you're a fan of this game, he's become a cult icon. Every fan disagree. loves Tony Ferguson. I'm going to disagree. Just feel for him. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to disagree with what you're saying here because to me, right, it's not sad. It's just like, mate, get it together. It's not sad. It's just like, get it together. Like, People, when I say people need to intervene, the UFC should have intervened a long time ago. Other people need to intervene here. Like you say, you, yeah, they might do it now, Adam, but it's four fights too late, three fights too late. After the Gaethje fight, he was on a massive decline. Have a chat with him. Anyone else in the world, three losses, you're gone. See you later, P45. 
what, because it's Ferguson now, he can just take the rest of them and more damage. Like, nah, I, I'm not into this all, let's feel sorry for Tony Ferguson. He should, people should have been on this a long time ago and it should never have got this long. This poor man. I understand what you're saying. I'm just speaking purely as a, from a fan point of view, watching him rise was so entertaining. And as I said, in 2018, I genuinely thought that he was the kryptonite that could have taken Habib's zero. Let's... The sad thing is, from my point of view, is that when people talk about Tony Ferguson in years to come, this probably is going to be the first stat that they bring up. It doesn't tell the story, and that's what I feel sorry for. Because Tony Ferguson, when he was at it, mate, he was super entertaining. One more thing, right? Let's, let's touch on this point again, because we're on it now. Let's go with it. Do you remember when Joe Rogan had to sit down with Brendan Sharp? Yeah, he shouldn't have done it on the national podcast. I agree with you on that. But he said to him, mate, it's time. You can't compete at the highest level no more. I'm pretty sure if I'd lost that many in a row, Adam, and I was sat doing this podcast with you, you'd have the word, wouldn't you? You'd say, listen, Brent, off air. It's yeah. time, you know, mate. It's time, you know, mate. Like, it's that many now in a row. Like, you know, you, you... this should have been happening three fights ago. And the fact that we have to even still talk about this now, it's sad, mate, it really is. But, I get, listen, you're a fighter, so you'll understand this more than anybody. How hard is it to admit to yourself? How hard is that conversation? I mean, you're not at that stage of your yeah. career. You're flying, you're still winning, you're still doing your thing, competing at the highest level and on the verge of another final, another massive paycheck. Yeah. But that... When that is what you are, when that's how you identify yourself, as I'm sure Tony Ferguson does, that's how he identifies himself. It's been his whole life. How hard is that to go, I ain't that guy no more? Yeah, really hard. Really, really hard. But it's we all have to do it at some point. So what do we have to do? Just watch a meltdown for how many years now? Like, do we have to continue to watch it? Like, are they going to give him another fight? Like, No, I don't think they will. I don't think the UFC will. I genuinely don't. But I understand your point of saying eight. How did it get to eight? Yes. Maybe it should have been four. Maybe it should have been three. But how do we get to eight? I understand that. So how does I everybody understand. else get the walking papers at three, but he's allowed eight? Because some people are just Tony Ferguson. I mean, yeah. It's, that's, that's one of them topics for me where I can't really feel sorry for him. Like It should have happened a long time ago. It should be, you know... Hmm. You know, you sometimes you just got to look in the mirror and be like, Fuck, eight in a row, right? When it gets to four, it's time to have a conversation with your family, friends, and your manager and everyone in it. Like, and then when it gets that's to fair. eight, that's double four. Like, come on now. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Is Tony Ferguson, Habib Nurmagomedov, the greatest fight that never was? <sighs> it's really hard to say after watching the skid that he's been on to say it'd be competitive. But once upon a time, it would have been competitive and that's hard to believe in it. If they make that fight in April 2018 when it was scheduled, I think that's an unbelievable fight, mate. Me too. I really do. I think Me it's too. a sensational fight. And so that's what we, that's like touching on your earlier point. That's how we do what I remember him. But sadly, we're now going to remember him for these eight fight, eight losses in a row, aren't we? Yeah. Um, speaking of Nurmagomedovs, in the main event at the weekend, Umar uh, jumped up and showed just how good he really is against uh, Corey Sandhagen. I remember watching Umar Nurmagomedov's debut and interviewing him in, in the post fight, and Habib was there, and we were chatting about the start of this fledgling career, the cousin, obviously, of uh, Habib. And I personally thought at the time, he's a bit one dimensional. He's, he's very. Listen, it's a Nurmagomedov. He's going to be wrestle, wrestle heavy, isn't he? And I just thought that debut, I thought, is there enough there? Can he develop those hands? Can he, can, can he get to the... Can he become rounded enough to really challenge in this particular division? Because yeah. I, I genuinely think it's a division full of killers. Mate, that performance at the weekend against yeah. Corey Sandhagen was nothing short of absolutely sensational. He had the hands, he had the feet, he had the distance control, and then when he needed to, he had the scrambles, he had the grab. Mate, he's going to be champion. It's just a case of when is he going to be champion. He has developed so much in five to six years. Corey Sandhagen, I swear, he is the boogeyman of that division. He's the hard, he like, I don't want to call him a gatekeeper because he's not a gatekeeper because he's an elite operator, but he's that mm. guy that you have to beat if you want to be the champion. He's always been there or thereabouts and he is the most awkward fight in that division. 
massive for the weight, tall, unorthodox, throws crazy stuff from crazy angles. And the way Umar dealt with that was incredible. And I really can't see anything but him being champion. Mirab's going to be next, obviously, in the sphere against Sean O'Malley. We've got Umar now that stuck his head above the parapet and said, listen, man, I'm ready to rock and roll. But also on the same card, the former flyweight champion, Davison Figueredo, sticks his head above the card and puts yes. manners on Cheeto Vera. Listen, this division stacks. And let's not forget your old mate, Pierre Yan, because he's starting to get that little bubble going again. There's a couple of eliminators here before we even get to those title shots. This division at 135 is absolutely red hot. Yeah, I mean, Marab is always a tough night for everyone, which we've seen. Um, it could be Sean's crypt tonight. You know, with the constant wrestling pressure, he's going to be constantly scrambling and wrestling and doesn't really give you a chance to throw anything on the feet. Like we've seen with Bilal against Leon, like mm -hmm. just them unorthodox guys, mate, that just do a mad uppercut and take you down and they just do madness, don't they? And you can't really train. Adrikas, same. You know, aesthetically, they don't look pleasing, but they work. So you've got that fight with Sean who's going to make it ugly. And we've seen, he's not fit for five, round, five rounds, he's fit for 25 rounds, you know, and that kind of pressure on you constantly, it wears you down. So you've got Marab and Sean, tough, tough fight for Sean O'Malley, a guy that's going to be in your face. Um, and then Uma, I mean, wow, incredible performance. Peter Yan coming off a knee injury, coming back around. Shark Tank. Shark Tank, I like Red to call up. it. Red up. Red Hot, and they're all gunning for uh, Sean O'Malley. There's a lot of money in that division as well, obviously, with Sean being a bit of a star. I'm sure we're going to get some big, big fights over the next six to 12 months. Um, another person that is rising... Um, I I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't too keen on his call-out of Nick Diaz. I'm thinking, <laughs> mate, you've wasted that. What are you doing, man? You've just, you've just put a great performance in against Mikhail Olejciuk in the, in the co-main event. Why are you wasting your call-out? Come on, bro. Let's get after a ranked fighter. Uh, but Shara Bullet, Shara, uh, Shara Magomedov, listen, he's got an unbelievable story, this fella. Whether you like him, whether you don't yeah. like him, I mean, he looks like a Bond villain. He's got everything, hasn't he? And uh, he was vicious at the weekend. Yeah, I remember him from Thailand, mate, up and down the soil with his bandana on. I just think, wow. Like, he's one of those guys that you look at and think, wow. Like, yeah, he, is, he looks the part, fights the part. Nick Diaz, why? Like, no, random. Like, yeah. if you'd have put odds on who he's going to call, the out, call out. 10,000 to one, wouldn't you? It just came from absolutely nowhere. I'm like, what? Eh? Why have you done that? You've just Nick, Nick you've Diaz. just literally battered this fella in the core men, mate. Call for someone big in the division. Don't get me wrong. We're talking about an OG of the game. But, you know, you've just we've just been speaking about Tony Ferguson. If he's going to have one more... Nick Diaz is the type of names that you would probably bring into that type of conversation. Not Shara Bullet. Come on, man. I mean... Uh, but but how far do you think he can go? Uh, mm, I don't know. I've seen a few holes as well, like you did. I bet you did. I see, you know, I do think um, good wrestlers, good scramblers could give him a few problems. Yeah. Um, but he looks the part, fights the part. He's doing all the right things at the minute. And he's playing his role, isn't he? In, like he's playing that villain role in it. I like it. He knows where his marketing is, and he's like, "Yep, okay, this is how you want, mate. This is how I'll play it." And he's doing really well with that. I like him. I do like him. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned Michael Chiesa. He called out Colby Covington eventually in the post uh, fight media thing backstage. Listen, I don't think he's going to get a Colby Covington fight. Covington's going to do Covington things. I don't think he's going to take an unranked fighter next. It's going to be interesting to see how all that plays out. A couple of things that I did want to highlight off this particular card is, one, Jai Herbert, great to be back in the wing column, look really good. When he gets going, when that when he's in that flow state, Ooh. he looks absolutely mustard. There's the old black country banger. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, Jordan Vichenik, uh, Cage Warriors champ, getting an opportunity, short notice against Gurren Kutta Taladze. I've got a few thoughts on this. Tell me. But that, but, but that first five minutes, mate, Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything I've got. Right, I'll just pour it. I'll pour it out of you. Let's go. I thought he handled fight week brilliantly. We're talking about a lad that's been wanting to be in the UFC for a period of time. Got a call last minute to fight on a real killer, a guy that should be ranked. Let's be honest. Good and good to lads. It is very, very good. He might have had a raw deal with some matchmaking. I think a bit more favourable matchmaking. He would be a ranked fighter right Agreed. now. And he's pushed a lot of top guys very, very closely. Anyway, Jordan steps up. I'll do it last minute. No bother. 
He looked like he was a UFC vet. Looked like he'd been there for ages. First five minutes, I thought he was absolutely sensational. Mustard on the feet, lighting him up. Loads of beautiful feints, taking him to pieces. And we're doing this against Guram. Wow. The, then the second round kicks in. And I think it's nip and tuck, very, very close, right up until the last minute. And then Guram takes over. A couple of big uppercuts, lovely big, big kicks to the body. And I would, I would say that it's 1-1 going into the third. That's when it all goes south. For uh, Jordan Vicelli and his team. And this is the key thing. At the end of the second round, going into the third, they sit down on the stool. And we are blessed when we're watching the UFC because the camera stays on them corner teams. You get to hear everything that's going on, don't you? And the team tell him, you're 2 nil up, Jordan. What? What are you watching, lads? He ain't 2 up. He's one apiece. Mm. And the instruction that came his way was, listen, stay on your feet. Don't do out daft. Stay out of bother. Here we go. You just be, you just won yourself your first UFC fight, and I'm screaming at the telly, going, "What are you what are you telling him this for, lads? If he does that, Gurum's coming at him like a train. He's going to get beat." And then what happens? The round begins. Gurum starts at 100 mile an hour. Jordan's just trying to stay out of bother, gets himself in bother, and ends up losing the fight. Just, I hope that everybody holds their hands up because. That corner advice in between rounds two and three cost Jordan Vichenik a chance of beating Gurum Kuta Taladze. I think if the instructions were better, I can't really blame Jordan because he did what his corner told him to do. That's kind of what you've got to do in those particular moments. He tried his best to adjust as the fight was as progressing that last five minutes. But by that point, Gurum was in the, in the mode of it, mate. And he, took, and he just steamrolled him. Yeah, well, a couple of points here from myself as well. Uh, Jordan, have I not been calling for this man to sign for the UFC? For you a have. Time? I've always been a big fan of Jordan. I think, what did he do in Cage Warriors, the stat man? How many wins in a row? Uh, mate, ridiculous. I can't give you the exact number, but what he did, he's multiple time champion as well. And he's been in with the very, very best in, in, in Cage Warriors. Been in with the best. Too. Paul Hughes, amazing fights fight. with him. You know, just took one again the other day. Quick finish. This guy is a true UFC calibre fighter. And he has been for a long time. Long, long time. Just shows what a set of cojones he's got on him to step up and fight Garam on short notice. Who is, like I say, a couple of unfavourable matches. Yeah. Mm. Garam is a world beater. He really is. So you've got to step up. You should already be in the UFC off your own merit. But now you've got to take a last minute replacement. You're Cage Warriors champion. Right? So you have been for a long time as well. And you deserve it. So now you have to... Take a short notice fight, which you don't deserve because you deserve to get in there on your own merit and have a full camp. He goes in on that, has a razor thing fight, uh, razor close fight, and touching on the corner point. Now, this is always a massive thing for me, and it's a massive thing for me personally in fights. I always say to my corner, I want two things. I want to know every minute that passes, and I want to know honestly, did I win the round? Honestly. Like, I want you to tell me honestly. And in my last fight, Judge your scorecards, I did win it. And me, me, me coach, Frank, said, it's very close, maybe not. So that was honest That's of him. good. Thank you. And after it, we had a chat on the beers, and he said, listen, mate, it was one of them. I didn't really know, so I'll just give you the benefit of the doubt. and said, no, so you'd push harder. If he was honest, say, yeah, like, you just sometimes you don't know, but to give the complete wrong advice yeah. Yeah. when it's very, uh, um, it's very uh, apparent clear. what's going it's on. It's clear. Like, one, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know what I mean, Adam? So it's like, you know, close fight. Jordan will live to fight another day and he will get up there. He will. He will. He'll have camps now. He'll get it together. And I'm a big, massive Fachenic fan. And I believe he can do great things. We've seen that on short notice, what he can do at the drop of a hat. Imagine a full camp Jordan Fachenic in the UFC. Can't wait. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I hope that he and his team have had them sit downs, big boy conversations. People hold their hands up and say, that won't happen again. We'll read the fight better for you, mate, and we'll give you a chance going into... If it, Listen, he might not even need third rounds going forward. He might knock a few dudes out, you know mm. what I mean, or submit them. But I just thought... I mean, how good would that debut short notice and you get a win over Gurum Kutatiladze on your, under your belt? <whistles> mate, that would have been some start to his UFC career. Still some start. He held his own. Exactly. It would have been even better. Um, whilst we're on the topic of everything that happened at the weekend, we'll flip over to the PFL because we touched upon it a little earlier on. Mate, She's getting better. It's frightening how this 
I say little, she's not little. She's tall, she's rangy, she's long and she's spiteful. Mancunian mm. is absolutely tearing the gap up. Burst onto the scene, the bit, the major scene. Anybody that's been on the scene has known about Dakota de Chepa for a bit of period of time. Last year, it was all about the European scene. She mowed through that. Now she's on the proper one and she's mowing through that. She's into the final. Taylor Santos is going to be facing her. Wow, mate. Big things, big things ahead of Dakota to Chief. Honestly, she's doing it in a really nasty way. Me and Dakota have got bad back pain carrying this whole organization. Honestly, like, we're trying our best. Look, look, main event after main event, and we're just dispatching them, Adam. We're just going out there and dispatching them, and it's Dakota and Brendan showing it at the minute. It really is like you've got two manks just on the world stage. They're just putting them in front of us and we're just taking them out and dissecting them one by one, aren't we? That's what's going on. Am I lying? <laughs> no, you're not lying. And well, the- one thing that I will say, British, we, we, me and you talk about it all the time, British MMA right now is absolutely flying, right? We have got Tom doing his thing in the UFC. Leon, obviously champion. I'm sure he'll bounce back and get himself back into championship con- contention very, very shortly. We've got a lot of guys that are ranked highly in various weight divisions within the UFC. You've torn it up in the PFL, winning one, possibly. I'm going to say possibly because we've got to, you know. Yeah, of course. Winning winning two PFL championships. Then you've got, we've mentioned Cage Warriors. We've mentioned other guys that are doing it, like uh, Phil DeFries, for example, in KSW. Yeah, yeah. Flying, absolutely flying. We don't talk too much about the girls. The only girl that we really mention is Molly who's been there or thereabouts in a couple of weight divisions in the UFC. And obviously some of the girls that have come before her, like Jojo and all these that we mentioned, Dakota De Chiva could be the game changer. And this is no disrespect to you as blokes, right? My job, I see my job as trying yeah. to help grow the, the knowledge of the sport in the mainstream. Yeah. When I speak to the football fan, they go, oh, I don't know about that MMA. It's a bit brutal for me. No, nah, man, seriously, come and have a look at this. It's the greatest show on earth. Come and watch the MMA show and hopefully they get hooked. Yep. From a mainstream point of view, if you can have a poster girl that looks like the Dakota De Chiva, that has a football following because she's a big Man City fan, that talks the way that she talks, and then when the cage door shuts, she smokes people the way that she smokes people, this sport goes through the roof, mate. The mainstream jump on board with stuff like that, and she could be the pilot of this fantastic plane that you lot are all flying. Well, the thing is as well, and she comes from a fighting family. Her mum was yeah. a multiple time champion in kickboxing and uh, and Muay Thai. She's got a really close family network of brothers. They all chip in. The dad, they're the, they're the most beautiful family you've ever seen. Honestly, they all chip in. Dakota's a superstar. They're all getting around that and going, right, this girl's going to be the next big thing. And she is just proving it. Time after time, after time, after time, she's walking the walk, she's talking the talk, she looks the part, she talks the part, she fights the part. That's the key. And she's ticking every single box. And you know what? I'm so happy for her because I've known her since, I can't even remember, over probably a decade now. And watching her uh, come on now and watching her come into her own and moving to America and making all these big moves. Mate, I know that I'm getting ahead of myself. But imagine being able to do this show in September or October when that final's done. And there's two <laughs> Mancunians that tore up the PFL. Two. Well, listen, there's a speech here, and I'm going to find Is it. it. Ready? I've got the clip. I did a speech, right? Listen to this. Just before I won the world title, she brought all her family to my meal. She was on the same card. And I did a speech about, I just want to thank all I've you guys seen it. for coming. I have seen it. And I yes, said, I've seen tomorrow it. night, we're going to get a world champion and we're going to have another one in the making and put it at her. And I wasn't wrong, was it? Look how close it all is again. Wow. God That's willing. God willing. Exactly. A couple more fights to go yet. Exactly. But what an unbelievable statement that would be. Not yeah. just for British MMA. Listen, we're claiming it. Mancunian Come MMA. on. That's what we're claiming. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but Bellator London, uh, the card has been announced. It was announced on Talk Sport. Uh, loads of great fights on there, Simeon Powell and various others. Uh, but the big fight that everybody seems to be extremely excited about is the rematch between uh, Johnny Evelyn and Fabian Edwards. Fabian, obviously, uh, was beaten the first time around, came up short. But I think he's, in the performances since, he seems to have just grown a little bit like there's a lot of experience gained from that first yeah. one mate and 
I don't know. With it being in London, I kind of feel, I kind of feel good about it. Uh, don't get me wrong, Eblen's awesome. He's fantastic. But I've just got a good feeling uh, with where Fabian is at right now, and I think he, I think it'd be a hell of a fight. Yeah, I was actually chatting to Leon about this. I was with him one after that Montreal Media Day, and I mentioned that fight. I was at the first fight that Johnny Eblen made. Good in it. Really good. Listen, Ray, because I know how good Fabian is, mate. He comes and trains at Cam's and cross trains at the same gym as me. I know how good Fabian is. So to beat him, mate, you've got to be really, really good. And that Johnny Eblen is, and I'm looking forward to seeing the rematch. Fabian's been on the tear since. Looking great. Can't wait. Yeah, that's all coming up in the not-too-distant future. Final one, a little bit of a sad one. Well, maybe not a sad one. We don't really know how this is all going to play out. But we also, in the aftermath of UFC 304, uh, Mohamed Mokhaev's contract's come to an end with the UFC. And we are told that he will not be re-signed. Um, I kind of like the way that Mo has dealt with it. I thought that he might go the other way and he might be not antagonistic, but maybe a little bit OTT with the reaction to it. I think he's dealt with it with an awful lot of maturity. He seems to have taken it on the chin, which I think he's going to board him well with the UFC. He's got a good, he's got good people around him. So I hope that if he stays fresh, stays busy, stays ready, you know how this game works, man. There'll be an opportunity where the UFC need a flyweight to jump in last minute because someone falls off. If he's ready and he sticks his hand up, he'll get an opportunity and then all he's got to do is fly. And I'm no doubt that an opportunity will come his way to uh, get re-signed with the UFC. But on the grander scheme of things, you win seven fights, you finish four of them, you're taking out top contenders, and you get released? Don't make a lot of sense, that, to me, mate. What is he, 39 and all combined? With amateur as well, yeah. That. Two-time world champion. On the cusp, cusp of fighting for the... But I'm going to do my stats. Go for cusp it. of fighting for the title. Should have already fought for the title. 23 just turned 24. And he has a little to do with someone in a fight game. And he gets released. I'm not, I, I'm not, that's it. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. That's it. That's all I'm saying on that one. I am sure it will work out because the cream always rises. Mohamed Mokhev is a sensational mixed martial artist. He'll get there. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow, but there's going to be an opportunity. And if he stays on this path, like I've seen him over the last week or so, deal with whether he's dealt with it with an extreme amount of maturity, I'm sure an opportunity will come his way and he'll get to prove what we all think he is anyway. And he'll uh, he'll be back, no doubt. Um, with all that said and done, mate, I think we're cooked uh, for this week. We're, uh, we're off to go and get ourselves prepped and ready to rock and roll for UFC 305. Israel Asanya's back, ladies and gentlemen. I've got stats galore for you next week. <laughs> Multi multiple time champion stats. They're all coming out of the woodwork as he takes on Drikas Duplessis. A battle. Two fellas that don't like each other. There's some bad-tempered blood there. And we're going to give you a full preview on it on uh, next week's show. So make sure you come back to the TalkSport MMA YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll catch you next time.